morning again, everyone, and uh, it's, uh, it's great to be week three uh, in our series today, Good God, looking at the goodness of God and all that God does. I thought I'd start by asking a question, you know, just to kind of engage us in maybe a slightly different way. How many of you um, enjoy watching the kind of behind-the-scenes things that you can sometimes watch online or films, you know, maybe about your favorite films or documentaries about people where it kind of goes backstage with them. You see a different perspective, don't you? How they filmed it, how they came up with the story, what it was like for the actors or what it was like for perhaps a, a person that you admire, You know, how they faced adversity and overcame it in order to accomplish the things that they have and deal with the personal kind of battles that they've had to face. So quick show of hands, how many likes those kind of peek behind the curtain moments that you can sometimes, okay, quite a number of you. I really like to see that. I really like to see the the sort of behind the scenes process, the backstory of people's lives, where we get to perhaps have a glimpse into the people we admire, not just their achievements, not just the things that they may be famous and well-known for, but how they actually lived and what really made them tick and, and how they really were able to journey through life in the way that they did. I find that quite uh, informative. Now, I, I think many of you know that I enjoy playing golf. Uh, sort of golf and gardening, both two Gs. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is uh, me and some of my family playing golf. Six Humphreys boys all playing golf together. Uh, what I particularly like about this picture, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's a ball on the green, which is mine, and the European Tour champion is chipping from just off the side. So uh, it's kind of a, a little picture frozen in time for me. Uh, anyway, that maybe doesn't mean anything to you, but um, for me it was important. So, so a couple of years ago, I, I watched um, what I thought was quite an interesting documentary about someone that I really admire, at least as a golfer, uh, about Tiger Woods. And uh, what I found so engaging about it is Tiger Woods regarded as perhaps in history one of the best players of of all time, uh, arguably one of the best players of all time. And what this did, it kind of went behind the scenes looking at the way that he practices and the way that he would prepare mentally and emotionally for the tournaments that he would be playing in. How he would think about his game, kind of what was in his mind as he was playing particular shots or at particular points in a tournament, how he was thinking about it, how he was feeling about it. And the idea was if you went backstage with him, and sort of learned some of his ways of approaching the game of golf, you could kind of walk in the ways of Tiger Woods yourself. At least, you know, uh, perhaps learn a few things as as a golfer. And and, and it was engaging and interesting because you came away from the sense that you kind of knew at least the way that he approached golf in a slightly more personal way. But then I was reflecting on what it must be like for his son. As Tiger Woods' son is wanting to become a golfer too and to walk in his footsteps. And I was thinking his son is behind the scenes with Tiger Woods in a way that no film can ever replicate. Because he's not actually behind the scenes with Tiger Woods. He's behind the scenes with his dad. He's behind the scenes with his dad. And his dad is coaching him and showing him his ways. And he's learning what it is to be a professional golfer from a member of his own family. And so you can kind of look at a continuum of knowing someone, relationship with someone. You can know about their their kind of public achievements. And you can know something even of their story and their approach to life all the way down to really knowing someone's character, a deep personal knowledge about the way that they have lived. And so when we talk about knowing the way that someone lives, we're we're talking about something much more personal. It touches closer to character and motivations and method and manner. And what's amazing is within the scriptures, within the Bible, we have revealed for us people who've walked so closely with God that they came to know God's ways. They came to know God's ways, not just the things that he had done, 
not just the big picture headline achievements, but the ways of God. And uh, not only the good news of the wonderful works of God, but a window into his character that we would know God's heart. And so this morning, I want to look just briefly at the goodness of God's ways, the manner that God works and works with us as his people, the way that he disciples us and takes us on a journey with him, which often can make no sense to us. Why has God taken me this way? Why is God doing it this way? This doesn't make any sense to me, the way that God seems to be working. And yet we can come to delight in the ways of God as we grow in faith and in our relationship with him. So let me pray for us. Maybe you want to open your hands to the Lord, or close your eyes, or just kind of still your heart, that this would be a revelatory time and in the presence of God moment for us. And so, Father, I pray, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would teach us your ways, that we would know your heart and your character and your motivations and your lifestyle as much as we would know your truths and your works and your mighty deeds. God, may we know your ways. Would you take us behind the curtain, through the curtain that was torn for us, that we could come into your very presence and know you in these richer, deeper ways. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's have a look, um, kick things off with a few things that David has to say about the ways of God. So look at this in 2 Samuel. Um, David says this, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? God's way, God's approach to life, what God emphasizes, what God values, the heart that God brings into everything he does and everything he says and every command that he has given to us, all his ways are perfect. Well, Psalm 77, verse 12 to 14 says, I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. The ways of God are perfect and they are holy. Isaiah famously puts it like this in Isaiah 55. You might know the scripture. Uh, It's so well known. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, this is quite a humbling passage for us as people. Because I think if we're honest, most of us, most of the time, feel like we like our way. (laughs) We like the way that we do it. We like our approach to life. We kind of think we've got things figured out. You know, my thoughts are pretty good thoughts. And in fact, if most people thought about things like I think, you know, the world would be a better place. We don't like to frame it like that, but often we can find ourselves thinking that. And then God comes and says, you know what? Your great thoughts, they're like the earth. And my thoughts are like the heavens. And my ways are as high as the heavens above your ways. They are on a totally different realm and plane. And so it's humbling for us to think of how God's ways are not just often different to ours, what would come naturally to us, the way that we would naturally approach a situation. You know, we have an enemy and they're nasty to us and they do bad things to us. And so our way is to get even. 
is to get back, is to get defensive. And God's way is to bless them. And that makes no sense. How is it God's way that we would bless our enemies and love our enemies? And yet this is the way of God. It is on a different plane. It often makes no sense to us. Here's the thing. We do not, as people, have the capacity to judge or criticize the ways of God. We don't have the vantage point and this perspective to be able to do that. What we can do, though, is like David, we can learn to delight in the ways of God by faith as we put our hope and our trust in him, and we learn to be with him and understand his character. You know, there's a subtle difference that can often be seen within the scriptures between the people who know the ways of God and the people who only ever know his works, only ever know his deeds. And Moses is a wonderful example of that. Moses and the people that he was leading. And so if we go back into Exodus, I think Ryan mentioned this in the first series, the first session of this series while we were still away, into Exodus chapter 33, we can see how this is fleshed out. So Exodus 33 verse 11 says this. You're welcome to photograph the screen or look it up in your own Bibles. The Lord would speak to Moses... Face to face. I mean, you could just stop there and meditate on that. And and how wonderful and radically different, perhaps, from the nature of our relationship often is with the Lord compared to where Moses is at with this. So the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So here is this picture of Moses standing in the very presence of God. This is really key for this talk, to recognize how Moses is standing in the presence of God. He is face to face with God. God is speaking with him, communing with him, revealing his heart to him. And Moses is speaking in turn, like a friend. God and Moses are speaking together like friends. Then verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, God, you've been telling me in these face-to-face chats that we've been having, okay, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. But you have said, I know you by name, And you have found favor with me. Verse 13, here's the request. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. Why? So I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember this nation is your people. And then look at God's response. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you. This is the response of God to Moses' request. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses is saying, God, if I'm going to lead these people, I don't just want to know what to say. I don't just want to know what to do. I want to know your heart so well that I understand why we are doing the things that we're doing. So that I can speak with your heart and your character. I can reflect your heart and your character. Not just the things you are doing, but your life. I I need to know you. Would you take me deeper backstage that I can know your ways? Just slight diversion. It made me think of Paul when he writes to the church in 1 Corinthians from chapters 12 to 14. If you want something to do in your Bibles this week, you could read that section of scripture. And it's almost as if Paul is writing to the church there and he says something along these lines. He says, you know what? I can see that you have a measure of understanding about the activity of the Holy Spirit. 
You're experiencing some of the acts of the Holy Spirit. God is doing a work among you. There's some miracles that are happening. People are praying in tongues. We're seeing people healed. There's a, there's a supernatural work of God that is taking place among you. And the works of the Holy Spirit are being done. And you know what? That is good. In fact, it's wonderful and it's exciting. But Paul recognizes while they have come to know something of the works of the Holy Spirit, they seem to have totally missed his ways. They seem to have totally missed the Holy Spirit's ways. And so he says to them, you know, all this stuff that's happening, it's great. You need to eagerly desire it. In fact, you need to desire it even more than you are right now. But you know, without love, you've actually missed the God who is working among you. Love is one of the ways of the Holy Spirit. It's the way that he seeks to work in and through the church. And so Paul says, don't stop at the works and miss the God who is actually doing them, that we would learn his ways. And so Moses says here, if I'm going to lead this people, I need to know you at a deeper level. And it's interesting, Psalm 103 if you want to do another little hyperlink jump from Exodus 33, we have David reflecting on this passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. And he says this. He says, the, work, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Now, it's true that very often in the scriptures, we have these little couplets where in the poetry of the Old Testament, we, they put similar ideas together. But there's a significance to this little couplet of ideas where we see a distinction. It is a relational distinction between Moses and the people where the people know God's works, but Moses knows God and knows his ways. James Hamilton's commentary on the Psalms helps to kind of reveal this link. And he says, what David is doing here is highlighting how Yahweh caused Moses to know his character and his goodness. And it was deeply personal for Moses. And yet the nation of Israel sees the goodness of God displayed through God's deeds, but they never learn his ways. It's why the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 3 says of the same nation of people, the same generation of people, their hearts are always going astray because they have not known my ways. Their hearts are going astray because they've not known my ways. You know, there's a great privilege to experiencing the works of God. Do you remember when Jesus does the healing and there are 10 people healed? And they all go away and only one returns. What was that about? It was a, a group of people experienced the miraculous power of the Messiah working in, the, in partnership with the Holy Spirit to bring about a healing in their own lives. And yet they didn't allow the miracle of God to become an invitation into relationship. They missed the opportunity to go on the journey of learning the ways of Jesus. They didn't become disciples, but one did. You know, every time we experience God's work in our lives, maybe, maybe God does something wonderful. There's a wonderful provision of God, you know, financially for you. Or there's a breakthrough in your job. Or you are healed. Or you pray for someone and they're healed. Or something shifts. There's an answer to prayer. Every time that happens, we have an opportunity. Do we celebrate the goodness of God or do we also see it as an invitation to say, God, what are your ways? I want to know your heart. I want to know why you did what you did in the way that you did. Would you take me backstage to learn from you? Here's the thing. We can be an amazed audience or we can be a loving son. You can be an amazed audience, or you can be a loving son or daughter. And what's wonderful about the message of the Bible as a whole, God says to all of us, to you and to me, he wants to take us 
like Moses, backstage through the curtain to become disciples of his ways. Have a look at this. Micah chapter 4, verse 1 to 2 says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It's kind of strange language here. And as we read through the New Testament, we come to understand it's actually speaking about Jesus. Jesus is the true temple that is going to be established that all the nations will come to and learn from. But it's in imagery language here. So in the last days, the Messiah will come. He will be the true temple. And and just, again, a slight diversion. to When we read about the last days, it's important to understand we have the right idea about that. I think a good way to think about the last days is to think about summertime. How many of you have been thinking about summertime through the winter and the storms? Okay, summer is very different to winter. Amen? Okay, summer is very different to winter. It's warm. Things are growing. There's life. There's abundance. But you know, summer is also a season. It also has a beginning and it has an end. There's even transformation and change throughout the season of summer. And and typically, the big harvest comes at the end, doesn't it? You get some first fruits and things grow throughout the summer, but really, that summertime is that season where all the plants are able to take up all the sun's kind of radiant power to produce fruit and the harvest. And so when we read about the last days, it's a bit like referring to the summertime season of the Messiah's work. It began, okay, the what would you call it? It's like the summer solstice. It's like the beginning of summer. When is the beginning of summer? June the? June the 21st. Okay, that's our consensus in the room. Put it on the comments on YouTube if you think we've got it wrong. So June 21, summer begins. It's like Jesus comes. And he comes announcing the kingdom of God. Repent, change, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the ministry of the Messiah begins. And the season of summer begins. And the last days begin. And yet we are still looking forward to the last day when there will be the great harvest and God will come and wrap all things up. It's why Peter can say in Acts chapter 2, the ministry of the Spirit that you are seeing poured out and all the people speaking in other languages and this miraculous stuff that's happening, this is what the prophet Joel prophesied about when he spoke about the last days. The last days are among us. Or the writer to the Hebrews can say, in these last days, present tense, God has spoken through his son. And so Micah prophesies and he says, in the last days, this is now for us. Because he was in the past and we are in the present on the other side of the summertime coming in. We, We were born spiritually in the summertime. Okay, You are a spiritual summer baby. I was born in the summer. My birthday is in January. Okay? You can think about that from where I come from. Okay? So born, I was born in the summer. You are spiritually born in the summer. Okay, Micah. Four, let's go on. Verse 2. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths so that we can know him. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You know, it is a whole world, every nation, every people, every generation vision from God that we would be behind the curtain. Not just an amazed audience, but loved sons and daughters of God who get to be face to face with God and learn his ways. Jesus becomes the human embodiment 
of the nature and character and ways of God on the earth if we will disciple ourselves to him. It's why Jesus can say in John chapter 14, referencing Psalm 86, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See the prayer that comes before it, Psalm 86? Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. This is the hunger and the heart cry of the people of God who have prayed this psalm for generations. And Jesus comes and says, I am the way and I am the truth. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And if you disciple yourself to me, the heart cry of the people of God can be fulfilled in your life. I do like the way that John Mark Comer puts it. He says, if you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt his lifestyle. You have to be with him. You have to live with him. You have to learn his rhythms and his mannerisms and his heart and take it all in to be his disciple and his apprentice, to let Jesus be the one to teach you. And now, you know, there is a key to all of this. There is a key to all of us. There was a key for Moses. There's a key for David. There's a key for the disciples. There's a key for each one of us. And the key is the presence of God. You cannot know the ways of God unless you are in his presence. This is how God answers Moses' prayer. Moses says, teach me your ways. And God says, yes, I will. My presence will be with you. My presence will be with you. And then you will learn my ways. And we think, well, how, how do we get to be in the presence of God? Because the disciples got that. They got to be face to face with Jesus and asking these questions and sitting around the fire and having a meal together. And, and they were in the presence of God as they were with Jesus. But you know, Jesus says, it's better that I go. It's better that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. And I will send another counselor to be with you forever. Matthew 28, he says, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. It is the presence of God that we can know and experience now by the indwelling power of God the Holy Spirit as God speaks face to face with you and me through the ministry of the Holy Spirit if we will become students of the presence. If we will learn to be with him. You know, I think many of us as Christians, we, um, we can do well with the natural things. You know, I can invite you to go home and take your Bible and read it. Okay? And some of you do. <laughs> some of you are getting there. But it's kind of like we can do that, can't we? Because you can see it. It's right there. And most of us know how to read. And so you can go home and you can sit down and you can read something. And you have, you, you've done the spiritual activity. But to learn the ways of God is a different thing. In concert with that, it's about praying, Holy Spirit, would you teach me to see what I cannot see with my natural eyes? Would you help me to feel what I cannot feel with my natural senses? Would you help me to be strengthened with a power that doesn't just come from food and rest, but comes from you? Because I want to know your ways and learn to understand your presence. And I can't give that to you. So this is one of the things I cannot give. I cannot give you the ways of God. I can know them, and you can know them, but you can only know them in His presence. And I can only ever invite you to step into that doorway and ask God to teach you. 
that you would be a son and a daughter, not just an audience. Do, do we hunger for that? I, I, think that, I think that many of us do. So maybe we can take a moment to pray. I want to pray that God, by his grace, would awaken us at a deeper level to the ministry of the Holy Spirit with us. And maybe someone, maybe on the welcome team, would you be able to call Ryan, pry him away from the youth upstairs? And perhaps some of the team can come and join us to be ready. That would be lovely. Maybe, uh, Sunita, you can even put some, some music on behind as we pray. Shall we stand together? You know, until a door is opened, we never know what's on the other side. It's just a door. <laughs> until the curtains on a stage are opened, we can't see what is going on behind it. Something has to be opened. It's why, the, why Isaiah sort of cries out, if only you would tear the heavens open and come down. And Lord, I pray for us as a church. I pray for every person. I pray, I pray this for us communally, but I pray this for us individually as well. God, I pray that you would tear open the curtain, that you would open the door. Revelation, it's, Jesus kind of gives this invitation. He says, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will open the door to me, I will come in and I will eat with them. It's this picture of fellowship, face to face as with a friend. It's Jesus' desire for his relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us grace to open the door to you. Thank you, Lord. Would you teach us the ways of the Spirit? Would you teach us the ways of humility and surrender? We don't come to the Holy Spirit with power. We come to the Spirit in surrender and humility and openness. Thank you, Lord. We come in repentance and we come with a softness of heart. We come and bring our faith as much as we have it. And come and bring our, our doubts and our fears. We bring them to God and we say, Lord, you know what is in my heart. You know the experiences I've had and the experiences I've not. God, I pray that you would come and awaken faith in me. God, I pray that you would come and open my eyes to see. Lord, I pray that you would come and I, I, I pray for fresh grace to know the power of God in my life. Thank you, Lord. you can kind of say amen to that prayer maybe just as our eyes are closed just want to raise your hands just those who are saying amen to that prayer i want that for me god we pray that you would come just we we reach out our arms to you just as isaiah kind of reached out to you oh that you would rend the heavens and come down god we reach out to you and we pray god would you come down god would you come near to us god would you awaken faith god would you pour out your spirit afresh god would you do a new thing in the church god would you mold us and shape us lord we want to be clay on your wheel far Father, put your hands on our hearts. 
transform us. God, we repent as the kingdom of God comes near. We want to change our minds, change our thinking. Lord, where our past is hindering us from our future with you, God, we pray that you would redeem our past in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray for signs and wonders and miracles to be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus, as you shake this place with the power and breath of your Holy Spirit. Would you fill this place? We just, we declare from the winds to come and blow and blow fresh breath, fresh breath into your people. May we stand and live a living army for the Lord. Thank you, God. Awaken hearts. Awaken hearts, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Awaken hearts, God. May they sprout, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Just as bulbs lie dormant over winter and the summertime comes and they sprout. Lord, I pray for a sprouting, a fresh sprouting of the Lord in this place. The seeds of the kingdom that he has sown into your lives over generations for some of you. And yet they have awaited a moment where God would speak and his word would meet with the faith and hunger and expectation of your heart and those bulbs and seeds would come to life. God, may there be a fresh sprouting of the Lord. May new things come. May things that have been hard become easy. Thank you, Jesus. May the doors be opened, fresh possibilities awakened, Lord. I pray for hope. I pray as you look at, I feel like some of you, you're looking at your relationship with God in the weeks ahead and there's no hope. There's no hope for change. And God says, my mercies are new every morning. My mercies are new every morning. Every morning is a new morning with God. And it's not the same anymore. Your history is is part of your testimony, but it is not your ceiling. Your history is not your ceiling. It is just what is under your feet. You know, if you're climbing a ladder or you're going up a staircase, every, every, every tread that you have stepped up is a part of your testimony. It is what is supporting you. It's what's brought you to the place where you are now, but it is not the road ahead. Your history is not the road ahead. It is in your past for your blessing to move on from. And so God, I pray for this church. I pray that we would go beyond our history. I pray in the name of Jesus that we would go beyond our history. That's not to degrade our history. It is our testimony. We stand on it. It's part of our foundation but it is not our ceiling. It is not our ceiling. I pray in the name of Jesus that where our history has formed our ceiling of relationship with you, I pray those ceiling ideas be shattered now in the name of Jesus, that the life of the kingdom would come in. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Rend the heavens. Where there's a ceiling, it needs to be broken so that the heavens can come. God, would you be poured out in this place. God, would you be poured out in this place? Fresh grace, fresh faith, fresh fire, fresh hunger, fresh passion for you, God. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. Let's close with this song.